Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the, uh, to the second meeting of uh, 2021 of the Wim Wimbledon Philosophical Society. Uh, this evening will be a uh, meeting that's hosted by the Poetry Committee, which is a committee of the Wimbledon Philosophical Society. Uh, it used to be a subcommittee, it's now a full committee uh, by measure of the board. Um, this evening's uh, topic will be Wisdom from Different Lands, an anthology of poetry, prose, and philosophy. It's a book uh, that has been distributed prior to the, to the meeting to everybody who is a member of the society. Uh, if you haven't gotten a copy of, of the booklet, uh, please send me an email and I will make sure that one gets into your hand. Uh, uh, a little aside about this booklet. Um, I do want to say uh, thank you to Roland, who has put a lot of time and effort and en energy uh, uh, part of the, as part of the poetry committee and putting this together at his own expense, I have to uh, have to say as well. Thank you very much, Roland. It's my pleasure. Thank and you, Roland. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and it's also, in my my opinion, it's also very professionally produced as well. It's a it's an excellent uh, presentation. Beautiful. Uh, so this evening, uh, on behalf of the committee, on behalf of the uh, society and the chair, I want to welcome you to the Wisdom from Different Lands um, poetry presentation. And uh, the, the agenda is going to go as follows. Leslie Dighton is going to have a, some opening remarks, including a, poetry, a poem that he has uh, selected for reading. And then we are going to go through um, in order of the, uh, the agenda that's actually in the booklet, uh, poetry, poem by Anne, uh, then John, Eva, Roland, and Juan. <laughs> Leslie's gonna have some uh, final comments to wrap it up. And then I'm going to lead a discussion afterwards, um, including po up to possibly three people who uh, want to contribute uh, a reading as well, uh, and then a discussion to follow afterwards. Uh, and so at that, at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Leslie, and I'm gonna mute everyone except Leslie, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ed. I think I've, I've muted Leslie, you have to unmute yourself as well. Sorry, Leslie. Okay, I was just gonna say the last one of these that I attended, uh, we didn't unmute um, and we didn't take videos off and half the audience were sitting there eating cheese sandwiches and talking to each other and making ribald comments. Um, and it was Peter, the conservatives meeting on the nine ponds. <laughs> So um, I think it's a good idea that we do mute while individuals are going. Good evening, Thanks. everybody. Um, uh, can, oh. can I just say, Leslie, forgive yeah. me, unmute myself, but poetry, in my experience, always goes rather well with cheese sandwiches, not to say a glass of cold beer. Okay. Well, if you're providing all both of those for everybody, that's absolutely fine. Um, welcome. Uh, I always find these events an extraordinary pleasure since we did the very first impromptu one at Southside House on poetry, which everybody agreed went rather well. Um, we had vigorous uh, performance by a Jamaican poet. Uh, I read some rather turgid T.S. Eliot and other people did wonderful, wonderful things. Um, but the highlight of the year, I much preferred these meetings when they were held at Southside House. I have to say that to Juan. This is not a criticism for your withdrawing Southside House, because I know it has its own special circumstances, but they were infinitely pleasurable events, and thank you in retrospect for them. This is a kind of highlight of the year for me because I enjoy working with the small subgroup, which I understand has now been promoted to a full committee. Uh, in the meetings are quite arduous that go into these things. Um, under Anne's 
careful uh, guidance, mostly at her house. Um, they're fun. Uh, they're creative. Egos get left at the door. Uh, people are respectful of each other, curious about what other people are going to say. There's a lot of learning and giving. And in my mind, they're a perfect example of common good processes and values at work. So I've really enjoyed participation in the preparation of these things. Okay, I can hear someone in the background asking themselves, come on, if it's that good, why aren't you living together in a perfect commune? And the answer, of course, is that you can have too much of a good thing, but uh, also that in the kind of vision of common good society, there is a great degree of diversity and plurality of interest. And it's... Um, uh, those interests are not going to be the same across all people, but we do all happen to come together in this committee with a common purpose and a common interest and common values. And I guess we take those that stance and those values into the other diverse interests that we have in life outside. Uh, that's why I only visit Anne and don't actually live with Anne and uh, Reinhold. Uh, you've all seen and read the program and inwardly digested it, so I'm not going to deal with the ways in which poetry and philosophy come together. But if you haven't read it, I suggest you, you do. I want to pass on to my contribution to... Uh, the evening's readings, and it's a poem by Seamus Heaney. I found it, um, as one does, in a series of lectures that were reprinted um, at Oxford when he was Regis Professor of Poetry. And I was absolutely transfixed by the argument that he advances, which is that the good society is one of diverse, plural, many interests, all of which empower individual creativity, but where there are recognised and respected constraints that avoid the uglier faces of individual greed and power becoming dominant. That's very much the common good philosophy, and as you know, I am something of a passionate aficionado and champion of the common good as a way of thinking and think and designing society. New for me, however, in reading Heaney and that lecture was that poetry he saw as being one of the great balancing forces in society. It wasn't just the beauty of words and the use of metaphors and analogies. It was, in his words, imagination, clothed in beautiful words and metaphors, but which pushed beyond the sometimes harsh reality of the world in which we live to other possible worlds where higher values and higher beauty were part of the norm. So that was a vision that he had, and it's certainly one that I share. So this particular poem of his that I've chosen is set in the Middle Ages, and it unfolds in a monastery in Ireland, where the monks are assembled uh, in community prayer. And they, in a sense, represent the highest good that we earthly mortals can conceive of, uh, because we can't approach divinity or get beyond our own reason. Uh, and their prayer is centred on the sacredness of the altar. So the poem actually goes like this. The annals say, when the monks of Clonmacnoise were all at prayers inside the oratory, a ship appeared above them in the air. The anchor dragged along behind so deep, it hooked itself into the altar rails. And then, as the big hull rocked to a standstill, 
a crewman shinned and grappled down the rope and struggled to release it, but in vain. This man can't bear our life here and will drown, the abbot said, unless we help him. So they did. The freed ship sailed and the man climbed back out of the marvellous as he had known it. So the question really is, other than the beauty of the poem, what is actually going on here in that poem of Heaney? Obviously, there are two very different cultures which are clashing. Clashing at their most sacred point, centred in the altar itself. We have a ship that can fly coming above us, and it gets entangled with the altar. There's a lot of pain, pain in the marvellous, as Heaney calls it. A crewman risks dying because he can't cope with the conditions of the sacred on this earth uh, as we have it. The abbot shows extraordinary wisdom uh, and exhorts his fellow monks to release the crewman. Uh, and in a sense, we're left with a picture of the two sacreds being honored allowed to be separate in order to become conjoined at whatever point they choose to in the future. Now, that's a kind of pictogram of the poem itself. And the context, of course, is Ireland on the brink of civil war. The most incredible atrocities were happening uh, at that time. And there was no way that people could see to produce a civil and civilized solution. Soon after, however, the Good Friday Accords were negotiated and they have been respected. And it represents one of the great transformative events of civil society uh, in recent times. The question arises, what influence did someone like Heaney have in seeding a different culture of ideas and tolerance uh, by the presentation of his imagination of possible reconciliation between polarized alternatives and how did that percolate through into a more general social acceptance? But the answer is who knows? It is of course possible to imagine infinitely uglier scenarios rooted in polarized and extreme self-interest as opposed to the reaching out for common cause and common purpose and respect as the abbot did in that uh, monastery at Clonmac Noisy. So I want to leave you with that thought because I believe it's the critical thought of today. I believe the world is polarized in, increasingly polarized in unimaginable ways that are seemingly beyond reconciliation. We've been through the United States experience and I talked to friends there who remain uh, extremely aware and conscious of the degree of uh, division and polarization and ugliness which continues to exist in the society which stands at the figurehead of the Western world. But of course, it's not restricted to America. We're seeing it throughout Eastern Europe. Uh, we're seeing it throughout lots of Asia. We're seeing it throughout Myanmar. Uh, we're seeing it with the Uyghurs in China. So polarization and an inability to see the mutual value of reconciliation and tolerance 
I personally believe is the greatest single ideas and value issue that we that we have in the world today. So I leave you with that thought. Um, and uh, it's obviously a fairly ugly and heavy thought. And the joy is that I hand on to Anne Vaughan Williams, who is going to do something much gentler and much kinder. And she has looked into the timelessness of truth in one of her own poems about the caves in the south of France. Anne, can I invite you? And Ed, can I suggest you turn me off or do I have to do that? Thank you. I visited these prehistoric caves with their paintings in France with a friend as a hitchhiking student in the 1960s. The cave complex hadn't been properly open to visitors and we had it to ourselves with our guide. There was only candlelight. The caves at Les Aisies. The old man gestured to follow him closely. The ground and walls were damp and cool. It was good to get in from the heat outside. He stopped, held the candle aloft to show red and black marks on the ochre rock standing out from the gray and white. Then it emerged from the walls, a deer, then a horse appeared, the mane blackened to flow as it galloped along. We moved on round a bend to a fat white pillar, a stalactite, beneath which was a low round stalagmite ringed and moulded from slowly dripping water, an apricot colour, marbled. We moved on past a bed of stumpy stalagmites like candles without wicks growing from the ground, like little gnomes. Moved on and came to a frieze of animals, deer and horses and a bison, their bodies fitting the mould of the smoothed rock. For the path we were on had once been an underground river which had shaped the rock. Dripping water from above had made the stalactite slow descent to meet the rusty coloured stalagmites. The bent old man led and pointed along a world made thousands of years before. In the flickering candlelight, the shapes moved mysteriously, as if our guide was come to us from those times. We emerged into the dazzling sunlight. And I'm going to read a poem by Elizabeth Bishop a great American poet born in 1911 and she lived in Nova Scotia and New York and Brazil and traveled widely. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 1956, died in 1979 and the fish which I'm going to read is in her 1946 collection North and South. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat half out of water, with my hook fast in the corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung, a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper, Shapes like full-blown roses, stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, 
which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed. The iris is backed and packed with tarnished tin foil, seen through the lenses of old scratched isinglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object towards the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw. And then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like medals with their ribbons, frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun-cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, 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 and I let the fish go. Thank you. And next we'll hear from John Jones. Uh, Anne, uh, I just thought uh, I would uh, bring a taste of uh, Welsh uh, to the society. It's uh, uh, another of the native languages of these islands. Um, the survivor of the Brythonic language that uh, Caesar and his Romans heard when they landed in Kent. It's all different from Gaelic, which is Irish based, but close to a Breton. Uh, and it's doing vigorously well, uh, spoken by around 900,000 people. Um, apparently, as many as 400,000 are trying to learn it again through new technology, through Duolingo, with varying degrees of commitment, I imagine. And it's a very strong uh, poetic tradition in Wales, uh, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But, but here's something from a post-war poet, Gareth Lloyd Owen, written really the first collection whilst he was still a schoolboy and a student and uh, this is part of this is the introduction to that first collection published in 1965 where I really think uh, he speaks for all poets and the making of poetry so prologue at the mar plant a close up my son I'm done it the golf can he have in him need does the normal not better to vasant megis embryo on a priest, a musker hen hen uridia. A cana a night vetro with a nose, by ganed, he view nevaru and in cleath. Pindia, a reed on ye, you grey the gerd. A hinir gawad sudden with her lount. A rule, he come a line here, Grunhoi. And to translate it into uh, English, he's saying, and, and here are the children that you've heard so much about. Enjoy the harvest of this endeavor. Over 18 years now, they grew like an embryo in the soil among the old, venerable old roots. And then in the ripe darkness of the night, they were born to live or die in our midst. Friends, we are the root of these poems. And before the sudden shower upon the lawn, somewhere rain clouds had long been gathering. Well, Wales is a country where poets to this day are heroes. 
crowned, acclaimed, cheered at the Estevodai, uh, festivals of music and poetry. It really is rather like being transported back to Shakespeare's England in a way. Uh, the sonnet is still a favorite form, uh, but there are additional strict uh, metrical rules known as kanghanev, harmony, which govern the internal rhyme and rhythm of every line. Here's an example by the great 20th century poet uh, and scholar, uh, Sir Thomas Paddy Williams. De Chwelid returning, De Chwelid. Ni all terfysgoedd deyar bydd gyffroi distawr wydd nef. Ni sigla leisia llawr rhwm ystyr y tang nefedd sydd yn toi di ddim di archol rehangder mawr. Ac ni all holl drybestod dyn a byd, darfyr tawelwch, nac am harry dim ar dreigl a thro'r pellterau sydd o hyd yn gwneithu'r gosteg a'i chwyrnellu chwym. Ac am nad ydyw yn byw ar hyd y daith o gri ein geni hyd ein holaf gwyn, yn ddim ond crych dros dro neu gysgod craith ar lawnder esmwyth y meidandod mwyn. Ni wnawn wrth ffoi am byth o'n ffwdan ffol, ond llithro i'r llonyddwch mawr yn ôl. So, returning. No earthly tempests that we make can mar the peace of heaven. There is no voice here with power to match its tranquil and jar that endless, unmeasurable, timeless sphere. Not all our human tumult here below can break the seal of silence, nor surprise whatever moves the stars to come and go, forever spiraling on soundless skies. For all our life, from cradle to the grave, from infant's cry to our last agony, is but a crease, a passing wave, which leaves no trace on that smooth, silent sea as from this earthly noise we find release to slip once more into this everlasting peace. So, a bit of Welsh there. I'm, we're now going to have a sort of change of uh, mood and we're going to uh, have a story. And I'm going to hand over to Eva Cobham to tell it. Eva, you're going to need to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. Um, sent you a ping. Um, yeah, I am unmuted. Yes, you are. Good. Um, I was saying that this is a, a factual conversation. Uh, I, I haven't made it up. Um, it's called Hanging Out with Grandma Again, which took place in the summer of 2020, because the first conversation when we hanged out took place, I can't remember when, was it three years ago, Emily? Well, she's muted, so you nod or you... Yes, it was three years ago. And it was on the subject of life and death and afterlife. And this one, is very different. And the picture where it took place is in the booklet. You will see it if you have the booklet. There's the pond in Amelie's home in Somerset. And it is called, hanging out with grandma, Pandora's jar. A translator of the Greek myth, myth misread the word pathos, pisos, sorry, as jar, as pixies, a box. So it has mistakenly come down to us as a box. But let's return to the original and call it Pandora's jar. I have not been back to the small village in Somerset where my son Paul and his family live for quite some time. But now the summer holidays have arrived. I'm here once more. While Ben, 13, has donned his helmet and set off on his bike, 
Emily just turned 15 and I have decided to clean the small ornamental pond in the garden of the house. The 150 year old house is situated at the top of a steep hill looking down the valley to the river Froome. A broad area has been flattened below the house to create a lower terrace. A thick curved wall rendered and painted white holds back the soil from the hill above. In it are two graceful niches while the rest of the terrace is open to the lovely view far below. In the centre is a round ornamental pond which Amelie and I have now approached. Amelie pushing a wheelbarrow with me following carrying a net and two pairs of secateurs. We position ourselves on opposite sides of the pond on its edging of weathered stone. This setting is conducive to a conversation on a classical theme. So with my feet dangling in the water, I reach in, gently pull out a handful of pond weed, and as it lands in the wheelbarrow, I begin. Amelie, I know you are interested in the Greek myths as I am. Amelie straightens up while trailing what could perhaps be a long frond of water primrose. Yes, Grandma, I do wonder why being gods, they do so many nasty things. Now take Zeus, for example, giving the jar to Pandora, full of vices, greed, violence, envy, and all the negative qualities humans have been struggling with ever since. And then telling her not to open it. What sort of gift is that? And as a wedding present as well. I lie back on the grass, hands resting under my head and look up at the sky before I reply. It's hope that bothers me. The one quality that remained in the jar. Pandora did get a glimpse of it, didn't she? before it was sealed in the jar. So humans can experience hope. If it's still in the jar, then is it there in reserve for when we need it? Surely grandma, says Amelie as she pushes a water lily flower back into the middle of the pond with her toe. It seems odd that Zeus sent hope at all as he certainly wasn't well disposed towards humans at that time. You seem to see hope in a positive light, Amelie. But does hope not also take us away from being in the present moment? It distracts us when we should be alert and fully present. We can get carried away by emotion and act irrationally. Vain hope, as it's called. As I say this, I pick up a handful of pondweed and toss it into the wheelbarrow. Emily is carefully extracting a water lily bud from the clutches of the encroaching greeny, Rhea, she replies. I see hope as different from both reason and emotions, qualities which Anthropos possesses. Emily has used the Greek word for human beings. But Elpis, here she goes again, Greek word for hope is not part of reason or emotion. It is available when we need it and lies dormant when we don't. She whirls a long strand of weed over her head and jettisons it into the middle of the wheelbarrow. Yes, I reply as I step into the pond with both feet, being careful not to injure the little fish, numerous newts and frogs which live here. Balance between reason and emotions is essential. Anthropos, my, it does sound grand, was not given the gift of seeing into the future, but does possess the ability to change, to change the effect of voice. However many vices whirl around and small the chances of overcoming them, there is the possibility of change 
and that involves having elpis, as you put it, hope. Without knowing what the future holds, Anthropos, by the use of reason and hope, can bring about change in the future. I wade slowly along in the water and smile to myself. Prometheus, whose name means forethought in Greek, molded the new being out of clay, but asked the great god Zeus for some of his spittle to moisten it, to give it form, thus endowing it with some divine attributes, among them Elpis, hope. It has the power to ease suffering and shake off despondency. As I write this story, I can't resist applying it to our present global predicament. The vices are whirling around, doing their best to create chaos. But soon groups of outstanding scientists begin working unceasingly, following in the footsteps of alchemists of many centuries with tenacity and resolve. After an astonishingly short time, they offer us something more precious than gold, a vaccine. Elpis flies out of the jar, circling the globe it calls on humans in the most remote places, spreading hope. I share my musings with Amelie as we pack away our tools. Yes, Grandma. It's an enormous step forward, but it is still up to us to make it work. Each one and all together, this is only the beginning. I understand Amelie's caution. Prometheus acquired for Anthropos the quality of forethought, thus enabling him, if willing, to endure present suffering for the sake of future well-being. If humans choose to control their impulses with hope in their heart and using reason, they can plan for the future and sometimes avert events which were inexorably heading for disaster. Gripping the handles of the wheelbarrow, Amelie heads for the compost bins. Let's talk again soon, she adds. I follow after glancing back at the pond. In time, the mud will settle and life will be happier for all who abide there. It's lunchtime. Perhaps Ben has parked his bike and is now busy in the kitchen. Oh, well, maybe. We can only hope. I pass on to Roland Rogers. Right. I've unmuted myself. Thank you very much, Eva. And also, it's a delight at last to meet the subject of our last two events, Amelie. It's a delight to see and hear you. And we look forward to having your wisdom in future too. Thank you. Um, when I wrote my little piece, I later discovered another fact which ties in to my story about um, uh, the connection with wisdom literature and the present. When L.P. Hartley wrote and began the go-between with the words, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. We knew what he meant, but he was not entirely right. 
The past is very much with us. And sometimes we do the same things as they did there. For instance, you and I will sometimes write like a Sumerian and speak like a Tuscan from the Middle Ages. I'll explain. One day, 5,000 years ago, a Sumerian scribe was fed up with writing and repeating passages they had wedged onto clay tablets. He or she, there were many female scribes, thought in Sumerian, blow this for a game of soldiers, and devised a sign instructing the reader to repeat what they had written above. That sign comprised of two small parallel vertical lines. We don't know its Sumerian name, but thanks to Tuscany, we now know it as Tito. Ditto. Therefore, that Sumerian scribe gave us a wise sign that saves us time and will forever connect us to that foreign country and the cradle of wisdom literature. I wrote in my notes that different tongues in different places produce different wisdoms, fairly obvious. While some words have common roots in sound and meaning, like kuku is kukushka in Russian, kuko in Spanish, I hope I pronounced that properly, or kukukusha in Turkish. Other words describing the same thing are dissimilar and engender differences in thought and poetry. So a skein of geese may honk geese to you, but when I was walking on Wimbledon Common the other day, the geese spoke to me in Italian and honked, Arca, 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 Arca. Which brings me to my three readings. I shan't read the English translations, but I shall only read the Romanesco and Italian pieces for a flavor of the sound and spirit and end in English with my own fable, which grew from wisdoms only a loving mother can sow in a child. Chalusa's Lipendidorka reminds us wisdom doesn't come with the pen, but with the mind of a talented poet. Lipendidorka. Un'orca, dispiacente, perché la gente la trattava male, si lagnò con un ciuccio, un somarello piuttosto a tempatello. A sentir l'uomo, l'orca, l'animale più stupido, più scemo, più imbecille. Non si ricorda che le poesie di Dante, Ariosto, Tasso e di tanti mille sono uscite tutte dalle penne mie? Per cui, disse Somaro, è una fortuna d'avere in mano un uccello a così raro. Fammi piacere, imprestami una penna, perché per quanto poco me l'intenna, chi lo sa, che pur io non ci rieschi a farne qualche duna? E gliele stroppo tutte, una per una, per scrivere gli sonetti romaneschi. Numeri is one of many examples of how Trilusa wrote and sustained democratic Italians with sage words over 20 years of fascist rule. 
numeri. Conterò poco, è vero, diceva l'uno a zero, ma tu che vali? Niente, proprio niente. Si è una lazione come nel pensiero, rimane un coso vuoto e inconcludente. Io, invece, se mi metto a capofila dei cinque zeri, tale e quale a te, lo sai quanto divento? Centomila. È questione dei numeri. Ma un dipresso è quello che succede a dittatore che cresce di potenza e di valore. Più soli zeri che gli vanno appresso. And finally, the firefly. Midsummer it was. Fireflies danced in meadows of light. It was better to be than not to be. Prowling the plains at night, the lion found the firefly pulsing under the stars. <laughs> You'll never be as bright, mocked the king of beasts. The firefly agreed adding, I wonder if a star could choose, would it want to stay and shine in the dead of night? Or fly like me in living light? Thank you for your time and for listening to my ramblings. We now move from the Italian peninsula and with one to four, we'll hear wise words from the Iberian peninsula. Thank you, Roland. Uh, thank you, everyone. In the Spanish speaking tradition and the Iberian peninsula, poetry has often played uh, the role of philosophy as a tool for questioning the universe and finding out the truth and also as a consolation for uh, the tasks that life brings us on occasion. Uh, so I'd like to read to you on that note some uh, extracts from the Coplas por la muerte de su padre, the verses on the death of his father, written by a poet called Jorge Manrique in the 1400s. He was a poet, he was all, his father was also a poet. And after his father's death, he somehow wanted to, to summon his life and, uh, and the meaningfulness and meaninglessness uh, of all and everything. It is also a poem very dear to me because my father used to read it to me when I was a child. So I will, I won't read it all, I, I promise. It's, it's a little bit too long. Uh, I'll read a few stanzas uh, and I, I'll tell you what the number is so that you can follow along in, in the wonderful translation by Alan Steinle, which was provided by Roland, by the way. And, and thank you, Roland, for that as well. So I will start with number one, in which he encourages the soul and the reader to wake up to the reality of things, so to speak. Recuerde el alma dormida, avive el seso y despierte contemplando cómo se pasa la vida, cómo se viene la muerte tan callando, cuán presto se va el placer, cómo después de acordado da dolor, cómo a nuestro parecer Cualquier tiempo pasado fue mejor. Manrique then evokes the glories of previous times and uh, meditates on what little they have left behind. 
So I will now jump to stanza 16 on the following page. <clears throat> the one that says in English, what happened to King Juan? ¿Qué se hizo el rey Don Juan? Los infantes de Aragón, ¿qué se hicieron? ¿Qué fue de tanto galán? ¿Qué fue de tanta invención como trajeron? Las justas y los torneos, paramentos, bordaduras y cimeras, fueron sino de baneos. ¿Qué fueron sino verduras de las eras? Then he talks about Don Rodrigo, his father, uh, at length, and shows him as an example of virtue and, and uh, good deeds. Um, just speak a little segment from that, which is number 26 at the bottom of the second page. Que amigo de sus amigos, que señor para criados y parientes, que enemigo de enemigos, que maestre de esforzados y valientes, que es eso para discretos, que gracia para donosos, que razón, que benigno a los sujetos y a los bravos y dañosos, un león. And then to the door of this gentleman comes death one day, as he is bound to come to everyone's door. That's the following stanza 33. And I'll just continue reading the next three. Después de puesta la vida tantas veces por su ley al tablero, después de tan bien servida la corona de su rey verdadero, Después de tanta hazaña, o que no puede bastar, cuenta cierta, en la subilla de Ocaña vino la muerte a llamar a su puerta. So Don Death arrives, knock upon his door, and says, Buen caballero, dejad el mundo engañoso y su halago. Vuestro corazón de acero muestre su esfuerzo famoso en este trago. Y pues de vida y salud hicisteis tan poca cuenta por la fama, esfuércese la virtud por sufrir esta afrenta que vos llama. And Don Rodrigo answers plainly, yes, it is time to go. And that's number 38. That's, no gastemos tiempo ya en esta vida mezquina por tal modo que mi voluntad está conforme con la divina para todo. Y consiento en mi morir con voluntad placentera, clara y pura, que querer hombre vivir cuando Dios quiera que muera, es locura. En the final stanza, Manrique finally reflects on the fact that the memories that his father left him and his forebears are a precious treasure to pass over to, to further generations. And uh, as I said at the beginning, a uh, deep consolation. Uh, and, and this makes me think also of, of Boetius at the end of the Roman Empire, talking about the consolation of philosophy. Uh, but on this note, I'll give you back to Leslie for, uh, I, I believe, to Leslie, yes, indeed, uh, for our extraduction. Okay, am I back on muted? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. As one says, back to our extraduction. How to do justice to presentations and readings like that. There were a number of absolutely beautiful offerings, deeply thoughtful, and voices whose timbre, I can only say that I envy to the bottom of my boots. Welsh, Italian, Spanish, and English. Absolutely beautifully read and deeply thoughtful. So, extraduction, I asked um, uh, Arola, Roland Rogers, 
playfully what he meant by the word when he introduced it. And uh, he said, well, you'll kind of work it out when you get there. And we joked about it being the last of the toothpaste in a tube which had been well used and you're desperately trying to extract the final residue before throwing it away. But I prefer uh, a more recent thought, which is it's the mustard that we all leave on the side of our plates. We're all, we all do it. And the interesting thing is in a conversation with Mr. Coleman himself once, he told me categorically that the whole of the profit of the Coleman group resided in the bits that we left on our plates. So the question presents itself um, as to what our sense of mustard is in the presentations that we've had. And you'll all take your own bits away and um, treasure those that are most important to you. The ones that really stood out for me, if I can just uh, touch the mustard on the side of the plate in each case, and brought forward the most reassuring sense of the past, beautifully described with a sense of continuity that was wholly reassuring. And then she absolutely terrified me with her fish. The poem by the bishop. And the bit that really got me were the hooks hanging like medals in its innocent mouth. Wounds that we had inflicted on that innocent party. John gave us uh, the most extraordinary uh, rhythms of Welsh poetry, beautifully read, and reminded us in one line of the shower, that innocuous thing that occurs on our lawn and for which we give thanks. But that shower has its origins in some much wilder place. And uh, indicates the insignificance of the interpretation that we make of many of the extraordinary environmental forces that we live within. It's another message about the insignificance of the human tumult that we all engage in. Eva's quite wonderful conversation with young Amélie invoked Elpis, hope beyond the scope of reason, wonderfully reflected in that disturbed pond which she describes, which once it has settled becomes the translucent source of insight which you can't see whilst the, the turmoil is going on. The line also that Emily uh, says, well, we, that's only a start. Reason only takes us so far. Working out a vaccine is only the beginning of a healing and a cleansing. And there's so much of Heaney's perspective in that particular piece of the conversation. Roland reminds us that in the beginning, there was no earthly wisdom. Uh, Ever's pond at that time would have been a milestone of chaos indiscernible within which we could have made no sense at all. Trilusa, who uh, is the um, benchmark really towards which Roland uh, reads and writes in that wonderful way, tells us that leaders need followers. 
You can't be a leader if you haven't got followers. And as long as followers act as zeros and simply line up behind the leader, then power is there to be abused. No follower has the right to blind obedience. The shorthand message from that is be upstanding and not bystanding. Juan, uh, with his wonderful poem by Jorge Malique, how quickly pleasures fade. How quickly that extraordinary pristine beauty of a camellia leaf, a bud leaf, wonderfully white against moss or the green background of the bush, tinges brown with its intimation of time passing, death present even in the beauty of the bud itself. And the poem picks that up quite clearly when Don Death knocks on the door of the boldest knight and says there is no escape. The message, the mustard that comes through that for me is that only love and integrity are timeless. They are the virtues which transcend all of the posturing, all of the positioning, all of the aching for power and influence that we all succumb to in our ordinary lives. Some of those were just wonderfully read. I had difficulty when Roland was reading, beautifully as it was done, I had to keep looking at him to make sure I wasn't listening to Inspector Montalban, though. Uh, talking to his sidekick in the police station in whatever that wonderful village is. So I just was deeply moved by all of those pieces. It's a number of times now that I've heard them, but I've heard them more deeply tonight and I appreciate them much more profoundly. What bit of mustard might be extractable from my little poem by Seamus Heaney? Well, I won't try to interpret my own um, contribution, but I will invite you to think about Amanda Gorman's poem on Inauguration Day. So very briefly, I want you to see me as a black young female standing on a podium confronting a discontinuity in history when two power systems were suddenly in collision. You might have difficulty doing that, so you might want to neutralize your videos. She said, when the day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find the light in this never ending shade? And yet, the dawn is ours before we know it. Somehow we've weathered the storm and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, simply unfinished. A lot of that theme of turmoil, tumult, loss of direction, loss of hope momentarily is present throughout many of the different readings that we've had. But through them all also comes that simple and single message, humanity not broken, simply unfinished. So those are my bits of mustard that I take from Colonel Coleman. Your individual responses are what counts and that's what we're going to move on to now with um, Ed Nano's guidance and leadership. So thank you all very much and back to you, Ed. Okay, thanks, thanks Leslie for uh, that wonderful recap and thank you everyone who contributed to the evening as really, uh, I wanna say uh, 
like Leslie, we've read these poems before in the committee, but to hear them, the, hear the spoken word has really brought them alive and brought a new meaning uh, specifically to me. And I really thank and, and appreciate uh, everyone who has contributed um, so far to this. So uh, let's, uh, let me unmute everyone first. <laughs> How do I unmute everyone? Uh, we can do it ourselves. You have to do it yourself, Ed. Okay. Everyone has to unmute themselves. All right, so if everybody could unmute themselves, I know this is probably not a good idea, but let's try yeah. it that way. Yeah. We're unmuted, I can't tell you. <laughs> unmuted. So uh, I'd like to, uh, if everybody, if we could give a, 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 a hand to everyone who has contributed, I appreciate that. Michael Collins, behave yourself. And unmute yourself, Michael. <laughs> okay. Um, I've written, uh, I've taken uh, some notes here as well, but before, um, before I go into that, um, I want to say we have a special guest, which Leslie has noted, um, which Eva has asked me to um, send a link out to Amelie. Um, and uh, if I'm um, Emily, Emily. You unmute yourself. Um, I'd like to see if uh, maybe she could say a few words about uh, about herself to the group, um, since she was a subject of one of the uh, in the narrative poem that uh, Eva did. Uh, Emily, could you say a few words? Unmute. Let me see. Ed, unmute. Yeah, sorry, thank you. It wasn't letting me before. Um, hi everyone, my name's Emily um, and I'm grandma's niece, um, granddaughter. I'm living in Brazil at the moment, um, but I often write a lot of stuff about for my school, I write a lot about um, philosophy and stuff. I sent grandma an essay today about um, existentialism, nihilism, essentialism that she read. So I'm interested in these kind of topics and in poetry as well. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so what do we have that I could say that Leslie hasn't already said and that the, poet, the, the poems themselves and the poets haven't already said. Um, we started out with um, Leslie um, talking uh, about uh, the, the concept of imagination um, in one of uh, the most contemporary, uh, most famous contemporary poets that we have, Seamus Heaney, uh, which he linked into the common good. I've, I think there's gonna be some conversation about that. Um, and uh, there, we, as we were going through in the committee meetings, the theme of the rhythms and the music of the poetry came out uh, in what, what she was talking about. I think there's something to be discussed there. John, uh, we had a little short discussion before this about uh, the origin of the Welsh language um, and how poetry is created. Uh, there's probably quite a bit to unpack there. Um, Ava gave us a narrative poem, the only one there uh, was an intergenerational conversation between uh, her and Emily. I've got a few questions about that as well. Um, but it also highlighted for me the lasting relevance of myth, which is a theme that is running through um, today's, today's uh, readings. Um, myth is very relevant in our society for dealing with the issues, um, the contemporary issues that we have. Often people think, that, think these things belong on bookshelves or they're read uh, for the historical uh, necessity but they are help us as coping mechanisms for what we deal with in the modern world. Very philosophical in, in uh, discussion around that. Um, Roland, a um, couple of the conversations that Roland has had up to this talked about the fact that he's attracted to, to sounds that are common to all the languages. And um, having him read three, three separate poems, two of them, um, in, in another language uh, foreign to us, and then one in common language. I found that to be an interesting uh, rhetorical device that will uh, have some questions about that. Um, and then Juan, um, I found very interesting some comments he's made it several times on the meetings 
that poetry uh, really played the role of philosophy in the society because the philosophy uh, for a large part is, is not on our shelves. Um, we have Greek and Latin and German and French and uh, in Anglo-American philosophy. We don't have a lot of Spanish philosophy. Um, so I think it, his contribution and uh, the fact that poetry did step in and fill that gap, I thought that was a very interesting um, contribution to the evening. Um, so we have this whole idea of the fact that we are in a lockdown and we are not able to travel. And one of the things that poetry and literature in general helps us do is to transport us to to different places. And we've been transported to caves and wells and um, catching fish and being visited by death and various themes that have, uh, that have uh, gone through the evening. One of the things though is that it always impresses me about poetry is the ability to transform the consciousness of the individual, um, not only by the themes that it's bringing up, but also in the rhythms that that uh, that it portrays, and if I was going to read something myself, I would probably read T. S. Eliot's *The Hollow Man* because it's one of my favorite poems. Um, but I can't beat Alec Guinness um, in terms of reading it, so I would I wouldn't even attempt it. Okay, and um, and that said, there are a few people uh, that have offered to read some additional poetry on the call. Um, and I don't know if they are prepared to do that. Michael, Michael Collins, you said you were interested in doing some. Um, so why don't we, uh, why don't, no, you're not interested. You're on mute, Michael. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. I'm not muted. Thanks, Ed. Right. Appreciate okay. that. Great stuff. Thank you. Would you like me to, well, those, those readings sent me scurrying to all sorts of things. Okay. And as an Irishman, of course, my, uh, my thunder was splendidly taken right from the outset by Leslie. So I can't go to Ireland. And as far as Wales is concerned, whilst I would love to go to the Gower, and I'd like to sample something from Ian Sinclair's Black Apples of Gower, which is what John Jones sent me scurrying to, I have to pass on that as well because he's already started my thunder. So I'll stick with New York and Archie and Mahitabel, if I may, a very short reading from a 1934 published poem in a fantastic little collection of poems called Archie and Mahitabel. Archie is a cockroach who types the poems in his boss's garage and Mahitabel is a cat who thinks she used to be Cleopatra. As it happens, um, Archie used to be a Vale Libra poet. He struggles with capital letters because he can only operate the typewriter by jumping on it with his head. So this is Warty Bliggins the Toad, okay? I met a toad the other day by the name of Warty Bliggins. He was sitting under a toadstool feeling contented. He explained that when the cosmos was created, that toadstool was especially planned for his personal shelter from sun and rain, thought out and prepared for him. Do not tell me, said Warty Briggins, that there is not a purpose in the universe. The thought is blasphemy. A little more conversation revealed that Warty Briggins considers himself to be the center of the said universe. The earth exists to grow toadstools for him to sit under. The sun to give him light by day and the moon and wheeling constellations to make beautiful the night for the sake of Warty Briggins. To what act of yours do you impute this interest on the part of the creator of the universe? I asked him, why is it that you are so greatly favored? Ask rather, said Warty Bliggins, what the universe has done to deserve me. If I were a human being, I would not laugh too complacently at poor Warty Bliggins, for similar absurdities have only too often lodged in the crinkles of the human cerebrum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was quite interesting. <laughs> I'm hoping that it might have brought a smile to everyone's face. It did. It did. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, we have Alan on the call as well. Alan? If you just hit the unmute. You have to hit your uh, unmute button there, Alan. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes, yep. you can. You can. Right. Um, this is a poem I wrote very recently. It's about Merton Abbey, and it falls into three parts. One is historical. The middle part is visionary, and I'm influenced by a, a piece of piano music by Debussy called the Submerged Cathedral, the Cathedral Englouti, and I do quote from one of his musical instructions there. The, the third part is more lighthearted, um, but it has a serious theme. Overall, um, I'm talking about French language and the way the Normans conquered us and so on. Um, it, I just explained that in the Doomsday Book, Wandsworth, for example, drew its name from the Abbey of St. Wandrill, the Abbey of St. Wandrill in Normandy, where the monks came over and they were given land at Wand, uh, Wandsworth. And I think that is the true origin of the name of the River Wandle. So, and the second half, of the, the third half of the poem, as I say, is more amusing, but it has a serious theme, but it introduces buildings like the Saver Center, as it was known. So here we go. Out from the Abbey of St. Wandrill, Norman monks set sail along the Seine and round the shores of England to the Thames, to where the conquering king allotted land, their own estate, and named it Wandrill's Worth, beside a rushing stream that flows from Surrey ponds and wanders down through bends and loops, through meres and lakes, and powers wheels to grind the corn for bread. The Wandrill, now the Wandle, flows through Doomsday's mere town, the town upon the mere. And it was here that Prior Gilbert came to found his church, upon, upon the very place that Stain Street ran a thousand years before, where legions marched to London Bridge, but columns Romanesque now march along the nave with dog-toothed arches with triforium and clear story above, and cloister wherein Walter and young Thomas learned and prayed. But where's the abbey now? There's only tarmac and hard concrete to be seen. But could it be, is it a cathedral that's englouti? that sank into the wetland years ago, we can but go and see. As morning mist arose from Wandle's banks, veiling all from view, the earth began to tremble, and then the concrete cracked and rolled aside, and peu à peu, sortant de la brume, the mighty abbey rose in glorious resurrection, and as morning sunlight pierced the haze, the portal and the towers softly glowed. If only Claude Lorraine were here, or Claude Monet, to capture shimmering light in classic or impressionistic style. But Claude Debussy's prelude can be heard with peals of bells that ring across the mills upstream. The air vibrates as monks with voices deep intone their plain chant in the choir. But can this vision last eternally? Then, as the sounds were stilled and silence reigned, the apparition faded and the abbey slipped back slowly to its watery grave and mortar sealed its secret. But no, in fact, the Vandal King had done his worst and seized the church and lands he sacked the temple and demolished it and took away the stone to build the grandest ever hunting lodge at Nonsuch Palace. Not even Jesus could restrain his hammered blows. 
But now, what's this great box that stands today on stilts next to the Abbey's ancient site? Is this the new Jerusalem that's builded here among the Abbey mills? At Eastertide, did God pass over where Overpass now stands, neath which the chapter house lies hidden? a line of stones and curve of apse, yet still a place of prayer. If Jesus saves, it's now at Saver Center, where the people come to worship at St. Sainsbury's Shrine and dress at m &S. But did the Normans ever leave? Their language and descendants are still with us today. We have that French connection. We hear the Citroens and Renaults roar along the Ranton Way, and Michelin rubber rolls along the nave where once the monks walked in procession, and Peugeot's park in bays between the pillars. But fumes from petrol fill the air where incense burners swung, and statues of the saints and marble tombs once stood below. The people escalate to Shopper's Paradise and wander down the aisles. There's food enough to feed 5,000 and garments to transfigure. What do we need today? Ah, oh, yes, some cheese, some camembert or brie. There's fruit of every kind from lands afar, as fresh as picked today. How can it be that such richesse is here for us to choose? A miracle indeed. What new to wear? Among the serried racks are culotte and chemise. And we could stay all day. There's so much more to see, but time wears on. With trolley full, we pick up some baguettes and cabernet. And now it's checkout time. But have we paid the price? We load our boot with bread and wine above the altar's rail and turn our wheels to face about, and then we're on our way. But we should pray and ask the Lord to make us truly thankful. That's it. Thank you very much, Alan. <laughs> I don't know how to unmute really simultaneously here. So no. we'll have to work on that the next time. The only thing, I, the archaeological excavations, I've had a look at them, and the actual line of the nave is in part of the St. Saver Centre car park, which is open air. It's the part that's between the raised Merrington Way, where the chapter house is, and the actual back of Saver Centre. So that open air sec narrow section is where the, where the nave ran. Um, and as I said, the chapter house um, is the only part, it's, its foundations, it's the only part that survives and it's in a sort of chamber underneath the overpass. Well, I hope that's not too lighthearted. I mean, it's a little bit bringing in all those names of, uh, you know, brand names and so on. It's, it's not quite... Um, like the other poems we've heard, but it's a little bit lighter and I hope that's acceptable. Well, thank you very much, Alan, for the contribution. Absolutely. Michael Collins is trying to say something. Oh, he's, he's got his hand raised, okay. Thank you very much, Ed. All I was going to do was congratulate Alan. And as Susie Mayo knows, I'm a trustee of Merton Music Foundation, which has just moved to Merton Abbey School. And so there oh. will be music in the Abbey again, of one kind or another. Watch this space. Maybe they'll do a competition. Watch space. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Pleasure. Uh, I, so everyone, so people are telling me that they cannot be unmuted. So I have to ask them to unmute. I'm going to go down and try to unmute everyone. I'm, I apologize for this. The first time we've used this function. No, I'm going to say I'm close. Uh, it's going on a bit. I think they have to draw it to There it. should be a ping that shows up on your screen, and you should be. Oh, able we're unmuted now. That unmute. That's um, good. Ed, um, Ed I, um, I wanted to just mention that. Um, oh, there's Mark. Yeah, 
I just want to know the same I can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. yes, I just want to mention that um, Rosie, my wife, and I have um, uh, taken to reading reading poetry after after supper in the evening. It's really rather nice in the winter. So instead of watching the telly, other poetry. And, um, that's really and that's really rather nice, um, particularly in the winter in front of a log fire. Um, and um, we. Uh, I came across a poem uh, which I really like by uh, a poet called Dylan Thomas. And um, I don't know if I can, uh, what I like about it is it tries, it tries to explain why, why a poet writes a poem. I don't know, what's that, what's that noise? Where, uh, I think that's Elizabeth with the red sort of waistcoat thing. Who is uh, that noise is a bit annoying. It seems to be a. Uh, it seems to be a background noise. You fixed it. Just go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't know if I can remember it, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, it's called um, "In My Craft or Sullen Art," mm. so, and it go. And apparently, he used to tour around um, uh, reciting this one. Uh, so this is Dylan Thomas trying to explain why a poet would write. In my craft or sullen art exercised in the still night, while only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor while singing light, not for ambition or bread or for the strut or trade of charms on the ivory stages, nor for common wages, but for my own secret heart. Not for the men apart, but for the raging moon I write. Nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and their psalms, but for the lovers abed, their griefs in their arms, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. There you are. Ooh, lovely. Oh, well lovely. Well done. Very good. Well done. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, I guess thank you, Mark, for the uh, thank you for the reading, and thank you everyone for uh, your contributions. Do we have anybody else on the call that hasn't um, emailed me previously to say that they wanted to present that wants to present now? Is there any? This is your last chance before we open up for discussion. Everybody's everybody's satisfied. We've had quite a bit of, po we've had an hour and a half of poetry. So I think uh, it might be time to move on to this discussion. All right, um, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, since we have about a half an hour left, uh, I thought this was gonna take about an hour, mm -hmm. an hour for discussion. I'm gonna move directly into the discussion um, so that uh, we give everybody time, a chance to talk. Um, some of us have done a lot of talking. Uh, and uh, so does anyone have anything that they want to uh, start with? I'll open the floor. Yeah, I would quite like to comment if I may. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I loved Warty Briggins. <laughs> Wherever Michael has gone. I, it, I just absolutely fantastic. I've met and known and quite like many Warty Bliggins in my time, but ultimately they pale and they irritate and they chafe. Anybody who believes they're the center of the universe has actually got the image of the world upside down. A comment on Alan's poem, which I thought was absolutely wonderful, actually. I thought it was a very beautifully phrased and thoughtful poem. Um, not at all liked, uh, but rendered lively by its uh, incorporation of Peugeot and m and 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 the brand names, which actually so form part of the culture that we currently live by. So, La Cathédrale Engloutie raises all kinds of questions. How can you prevent cathedrals that mankind over a long time has constructed of great value, values and ideas 
and processes and practices that we all esteem and love. How can you prevent that, not just architecture, but from slipping back into the broom, which is waiting for it all as soon as we take our eye off the preservation and the purpose of uh, that particular set of values that we have. So that's one thing that I'd quite like to put out because I, I actually believe, and here I am uh, blowing my own trumpet again, I actually believe the common good is fundamentally about that process of discovering ways of retaining what is essentially crucial and valuable in life, but not becoming um, uh, a world in aspic. Second thing that really interested me was your wonderful phrase, people escalate. I think they were going up to the food store and that's an extraordinarily clever play upon words. Um, I would just point out on that uh, because there was a hint in it and I feel it too of uh, criticism of that endless quest of consumption and um, searching for products that we all go through. Nonetheless, there was that extraordinary historical meeting between Reagan and I believe it was Brezhnev uh, on a visit to New York when he took him round a superstore and Brezhnev or Khrushchev, I can't remember which it was, was just so absolutely astonished by the array of consumer availability that was there that he said, you know, how long did it take you to put this together because you can only have one of these and you've done it for the purpose of my visit. And Reagan was able to say, well, of course, it's not like that. This is actually what fills every food store throughout America. So people do want diversity and goods for consumption and variety, but there is that incredible dilemma of excess, excess choice, excess consumption, excess devotion of national resources to what are in essence the fripperies of life as opposed to the value forming infrastructures that hold the pillars of society together. So the price we pay for baguettes and cabernet, as you put it, uh, and it's such a poignant way of putting it, uh, is I suppose a, cohe a, a better cohesion in society and a pushing back of potential unrest and revolutionary disquiet. Uh, it's not just television, which is the, the um, opium of the peoples. It's this capacity to consume at will almost anything from around the world, regardless of its environmental impact uh, and regardless of the other uses of those resources that we could make. Uh, it's too easy, as it were, to drop into approval or disapproval, but that they raise absolutely huge issues, and your poem is fecund with such issues, and I find it deeply, deeply interesting. So if we get a chance as a group to talk about any of those things, I would be very interested to hear what people, people think, or indeed Alan's own reaction to those comments. No fair, Michael Collins. Can we put Alan on, please? You know what? You know what? We can see you drinking that wine, Michael Collins. <laughs> well, Ed. that's because I'm Irish. Sorry about that. Ed, Ed, can we, Ed, can we put Alan on? Yeah, he's on. He's on. Yes, I, I, I feel very ambivalent. In some ways, when I've gone into a big supermarket and I just see all these things. One part of me says it's a miracle of civilization that and cooperation, the incredible degree of cooperation to get whether it's um, 
you know, fruit, fruit and vegetables or, or whatever it is from other parts of the world. You've got all the transport, people who grow the things, the transportation, the packaging, getting it all there is an amazing achievement. And yet, as Leslie says, you, it can be overdone. In an American supermarket, I saw an incredibly long aisle that was nothing but packets of cornflakes, mm. just brand after brand after different brand of cornflakes. And that's the other side of it. Mm. And of course, the environmental transport cost of bringing all these things. So as I say, on one hand, I think it is a great achievement of international cooperation to get these things there, but it's at a cost. Uh, can I just repeat what Emily said uh, earlier, because I thought it was very mm. powerful in her conversation with Eva. She said something to the effect, yeah, isn't it absolutely wonderful that all that creative talent has given birth to the invention of a vaccine through human capacity to, to trade minds and mental capacity. But she said, it's only the beginning. It's only the first step towards wisdom in society and we're seeing the unwisdom of society unleashed almost immediately in national vaccine politics for example um, yes. and, and it's true of everything that we do the human capacity to invent is almost endless the human capacity to make sensible use and appropriate allocation and distribution of what we invent is actually one of the great unwisdoms that we have not yet really resolved. Yeah. So creativity is a much, much esteemed uh, virtue, but creativity and inventiveness on its own is not in itself a sufficient recipe for a, a balanced uh, and appropriate social and political structure. I know I've talked a lot and uh, we're trying to give everybody a platform here, but I do have a comment that follows what you're saying, Leslie, on, on Eva's poem. Um, I was wondering in the next conversation that you have, is there going to be more of uh, an, for, structurally within the poem, is there going to be more of an exposition of is the well and Pandora's box, is there some sort of... Uh, there's some sort of intermingling there that's going on. I'm not sure what the right word is, but there's something going on between the well and the box. Um, is there gonna be some in the next conversation unveiling of you know, how these two things are uh, representative of, of something and, um, and how the vaccine comes into play in that? I don't know. She's in Brazil, <laughs> it's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Well, I, we shall I, see. I'll let you know what happens. Okay. I thought that there was some sort of unveiling that might be happening there and uh, I was sort of anticipating the, the next stanzas <laughs> that come along. For me, the key was very much in what she said about we have to do it together. This is the beginning. Mm. Unless we all put, you know, go with it together. Absolutely. It will work. And I thought it was quite interesting that only when the virus really got to people, to people's natural survival uh, feelings of wanting to survive and the fear, only then did we obey and stay put. So it's funny how only that basic instinct actually kept us locked down. Ooh. Yeah. Very similar thematically to uh, the last conversation we all had two months ago, right? With uh, Camus, the plague. Yeah. When people actually were affected yes. themselves personally, they didn't take it seriously. Yes. Okay. Does anybody have something that they want to they want to explore in one of the poems? Is one is one still on? No, I think he signed out. There was some heavy lifting in that poetry. Um, One had hearing problems. 
Oh. Don't know why. Goodness, space is difficult. That's Maybe nice. that was a South Side House issue. Well, oh, is he in South Side House? Well, maybe thick walls and all the rest of it, you know? Oh, okay. So uh, I did a count of the poems that were read, and actually there were, uh, there were five poems that were read in English, and there were five poems that were read in other languages. Now, that's not representative of the word count. It's the number of poems that were read. So I found that interesting, that it was balanced. Um, when we called it wisdom from different lands. It was actually balanced quite equally. Um, you know, half of our native tongue and half in, 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 in another language. I found that to be interesting. I don't know. If, I don't know if it was by design, Roland, but I don't remember that being so. No, I think that was pure accident. Um, right. <laughs> Good accident. Good accident. A happy accident. Yes. Happy, I, I think happy it's accident. An extraordinary tribute to the society, actually, that its instinct is to range across the world and different languages and these weren't these weren't amateurish deliveries of foreign voices they were extraordinarily gifted both in their reading and in their mode of articulation so i think we can take huge credit from the fact that sitting here in this particular place we come up with 50 percent international exposure i think it's wonderful yeah May I say something on the actual experience of reading? I was very thrown by reading into a vacuum. I think I would prefer to hear munching cheese sandwiches <laughs> than you would, have some sort you. of response. Cheers. Even if it's, it's cheers. just boo or meh or something, <laughs> or a munch, or the mustard, or whatever. Oh, because to read in a complete silence was really put me off my stroke to start with until I sort of got used to it but it's not comfortable. Well, we'll take that into, we'll distribute cheese sandwiches next time before the reading. Yeah. Uh, well, unmute and distribute sandwiches. That'll do very nicely. Yeah, not in my view, but there you go. So there's a lot of classical conversation in there, right? I mean, in, in the, in, when I did my, my reading of the of the booklet, not mentioning um, actual Greek words specifically, but Greek names from from either history or fables. We had the name Greeks. We had Aesop. We had Socrates, Prometheus, Pandora, Trojan, and Zeus twice uh, showed up in the readings. Um, and then across, uh, obviously, in uh, Roland's, there was there were quite a bit of Roman uh, attributions as well. So there's. Uh, a, a, in the Wimbledon Philosophical Society, there is a deep Greek vein that is being, uh, I don't know what the word is, what is being mined right now in, in this conversation. Not sure what to make of that. <laughs> Mark looks confused. It's too profound. <laughs> too profound for words. You're on, you're on mute, Mark. Mark, oh, unmute. There you are. I think he's trying to talk, but he can't. Oh, yeah. you know, I'm just having trouble with my Wi-Fi. That's oh, okay. There's a packed up. I don't know why. Okay. Can I can I raise a point? I don't want to over talk, but the two words that really interested me in what you said at the beginning, Ed, which you chose not to go on to talk about, was transformation of consciousness. And you mentioned, I think it was you, mentioned Eliot and the hollowness of man. Was it you? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes, it was. I would love us to pause just for a second as a group on that very issue. How do you transform human consciousness? Because until you do that, the values don't fall into place. Until the values and the consciousness fall into place, then the instrumentality of action and policies and so on doesn't follow. So the very start of an improvement, an amelioration in life and values and beliefs has to start with, with that transformation of consciousness. How do we do that? There's a problem with that idea. It's um, who is transforming that consciousness? Um, are we able to transform consciousness 
communally. And I think we can't if we look at the internet and social media. Um, it's a very hard thing to do. Hmm. I, I, would I, think, I think also, Roland, if you, if you take just the pub, it's a very hard thing to do. It, Never mind I'd the love internet. To get to the media. Pub. <laughs> Well, no. we'll all get there. Someday. Same principle applies, although the scalability is different. I think what I, I think what I was thinking of, Leslie, when I when I said that was uh, a couple of weeks ago. I read an article in I think it was the Times about uh, the Church of England will yep. essentially be gone within fifty years uh, yep. at the rate of replacement that's occurring, or the the rate of displacement that is now occurring, and and the replacement rate is falling. Um, and they interviewed one of the um, pastors in the in the in the in the area, and the solution was um, that appeals to reason and um, argu argumentation uh, largely go. You know, people get into a battle mode and they don't listen. And so, what he has started in his church was a poetry reading group. You know, I was reading about poetry group. Um, and he said that this is one of the ways that he finds that it's, it has more access, people are more accessible to new ideas or to alternate ways of living, transforming your consciousness, so to speak, is using poetry as a methodology to, to, to access the mind rather than direct argumentation, you know, uh, the, 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 the classic Christian arguments, you know, um, whether it's Pascal's wager or something like that, but reading something from poetry in terms of transformative. And I was thinking about ways that this group would be beneficial, um, you know, to us, we're spending two hours. And one of the things that we're trying to do is be transported to other, other places. Uh, you know, we, we were discussing right before this call, whether it's in the, in the Mediterranean or it's in Wales or in your case, Ireland or, um, you know, Anne is in, in France, and you had these uh, poems, poem from Spain, these Italian poems. These are the transformation that's occurring uh, all across, and I think that that was really what I was what I was trying to hit upon. And I see Mary has a question. Uh, Mary, let me. You're unmuted, I think. Mary, are you? No. You're, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're unmuted now. Okay. Hello, yes, I, I just zoomed in on the concept of transformation and wanted to unpack that a little bit. Consciousness. Uh, transformation of consciousness, because, yeah, I mean, I think that has several aspects to it, doesn't it, that idea. Um, someone earlier said something about, was it to do with the Camus talk about followers, leaders needing followers. Uh, that was me and Ed was raising issues about uh, La Peste and Camus. Oh, right. Yeah, you, yeah. You can choose between us. <laughs> well, I think I'll, I'll forge my own way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think transformation of consciousness to me has quite... Um, sinister connotations as one aspect of it. I mean, if you think about what the um, Chinese are talking about doing or not talking about doing to the Uyghurs, you know, is that, is that an attempt to transform consciousness? It, it's, it's to do with power sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the complexity of the idea, uh, and it came up in what Roland said earlier, is who pulls the levers and what are the objectives in what you're doing. If you have a completely unbalanced society like China versus the Uyghur minority population, and their attempt is to create greater and greater subservience, both economic and political, uh, then obviously you get a degradation of that society and, Cultural. and consciousness mm. is, is uh, transformed, but in an absolutely inappropriate way. So we do have to deal with the substance of what the transformation is that we are aiming for. 
and that, that so if you ask that question uh, a, a, a different way around has the united states for example in its recent election moved towards a transformation of consciousness which is an improvement on the power system that it had before which was violently Trumpian and right-wing and America first and self-interest and exceptionally narrow and anti-immigrant and so on. I think most people, I can't even say that, but many people would look at the set of values that prevailed during that period. And whilst understanding, as I think I do, the sense that Trump had that jobs were being violated in the states by an unequal and unfair global economic system. If you can price something at whatever level you choose, because you control whether you put environmental costs in or not, and because you can manufacture and manipulate your currency level, with those two factors of, of cost, you can dominate world trade very easily and very quickly. So, China was, was tearing the heart out of um, American manufacturing. Then you got this incredible rust belt and its deterioration so that you get Detroit now and Philadelphia. Unrecognizable sin bins of opiate dealing and lack of any kind of um, historically liberal um, middle ground that, in a sense, we used to associate with them. So uh, he put his finger, I think, Trump, on something really important. The processes that he then went through to um, transform consciousness towards the solution that he wanted, which was more jobs and more recovery of investment in the US, in my view, was unthinkably awful and uh, was not a substantive improvement in what we had before. So you're absolutely right. Who controls it is the crucial question. And what is the set of values that you're, that you're actually seeking to create a cooperative consensus about? Very difficult. And exactly, and it's not only about out there. We can look at our own society and what's yeah, going no, on. Absolutely, absolutely. But I would say, uh, in response to that complex yes in how to deal with it, but in those two little words that I used earlier, upstanding rather than bystanding, it is not enough to back out of that complex debate simply because you don't know what the specific answers are at any point in time. What you need is a balance of power positions in society that somehow regulate its um, instinctive tendency to veer towards one block of power versus another. And we've had great periods in history where labor has been excessively dominant. We're now in a period in this country where free markets are excessively dominant, in my view. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Leslie. We've got a couple of hands raised here. Bruno, you want to, uh, are you unmuted now? I think I'm unmuted, thank you now. I think Michael was before me though. Okay, Michael, you first, then Bruno. No, no, I give way to Bruno, that's fine. Uh, Thank you. Bruno. So, yes, yeah, just, just three, three observations really, besides thanking everybody for their wonderful contributions. The, the first is transformation of consciousness. I really don't understand what that means and I'm not sure that I want my consciousness transformed. <laughs> the second thing is- Not willingly. That's the best joke. <laughs> Mary mentioned leaders and followers, and I, I can't remember exactly the point she made, but that took me straight back to the wonderful True Lucy poem that, uh, you know, that the poet we have just been introduced to, where, um, you know, he says, uh, it, it, you know, talking about leaders and followers, you know, when I place myself ahead of five zeros like you, I become, guess, uh, 100,000. It's a matter of numbers. It's what happens to a dictator who grows in power and value with every zero that follows him. And I think, you know, th that, that poem is certainly one of the takeaways for me this evening. As is the very first poem that 
uh, we, we read. And here I have a question for the group. That wonderful poem uh, from Squarings that Leslie kindly read to us. I'm really intrigued by that last line. You know, what yeah. is that marvelous? What other word could he be, could have been used? The man mm. came back out of the marvelous if he had known it. Does anyone have any insight into what that wonderful last line really means and why the word marvelous is chosen? It, it, if I can just say that, I think it's a really important question. And it's even more complex than that because in a sense, it's the man who is climbing back out of a condition that he couldn't sustain and live in, which is described as marvelous. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's marvelous, obviously in one context, and that must be the earthly context of monks in a monastery with their own specific access to truth and divine insight compared with whatever the marvelous is that allows a ship to fly through the sky and um, become enmeshed with the sacred altar in the other place. We don't have, I mean, you can't ponder on what the nature of the other marvelous is. I can't anyway. But you do have to ask what the nature of the marvelous is out of which he had climbed back up. Mm. So do you have an answer to that? No, I don't. I, I'm very intrigued by it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to have better questions than answers, probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not knowing is good. Yes. Thank good you. questions, not necessarily answers. Mm. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Do we want to continue this or uh, should we um, say good evening to each other and uh, maybe continue this conversation in email form by passing questions? Maybe we could unpack a little bit more what transformation of consciousness is. Can I just thank Anne and Eva in particular? So, um, I, I, you can't see her in the background, but my better half, Sue, is, is sitting in on, on this and uh, reminding me that the human condition, as summarized by a hitchhiker ending up in, I was a hitchhiker too, but I never ended up in, in, in caves in France. But thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for those observations. It is so hard to square off the human condition thing with the political thing and all that stuff. But it's great to, to be taken into those spaces again, where actually the politics can be left at the cave entrance or at the pool side, let us say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. That's very good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for thanks caring. Thanks to Alan Paul for his uh, fine poem. I liked it very much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.